In this video, I'd like to discuss the preface to the book by E. H. Gombrich, The Story of Art. This is one of the best-selling art history books of all time, if not the best-selling art history book of all time. And in this preface, Gombrich sets out the rules uh, by, uh, the, by which he's written this book and the positive aims of this book, as well as a bit on the structure of this book and how each chapter is laid out. So what are the rules? What are these aims? What is this structure? The rules start with the fact that he's not going to use lots of technical jargon. He's not going to try and speak down by using lots of intricate, complex words, which only art historians with PhDs know, uh, because that sounds condescending, because the whole work is aimed at people who are very new to the art world, particularly people in their teenagers, uh, particularly teenagers who are discovering the art world for the first time, but also anybody who's discovering the art world for the first time. And he doesn't want to put those people off with technical jargon and sound like he's condescending uh, to them. Also, he has favoured artworks which he himself has seen, uh, as opposed to ones which he's just seen uh, photographs of, uh, as well as the fact that he has chosen artworks which he, which he can actually illustrate uh, in the book, which he can put photographs of in, in the book, illustrations in the book, as opposed to works which he doesn't have illustrations for, which you can only just talk talk about, because obviously it's harder to understand a work of art if you don't actually see it. Other rules that he has applied to himself is that he's only talking about really great works of art, the greatest masterpieces out there, and that's because he doesn't want to dedicate uh, a book on art to non-art, to art which is objectionable. So he's only focusing on really great masterpieces of the highest standards of perfection. And also he's tried not to be original. He's tried not to just pick his personal favourites, but actually to go for those artworks which are generally regarded as the greatest and the masterpieces. And that has the benefits of people actually know them, so they're not going to feel too put off by these strange foreign names that already have a bit of familiar. They're good, like good landmarks, which people can can uh, can can hold hold to, can be reminded that they're not not too far from stuff that they don't know. As well as the fact that he says that actually, in general, those artworks which are the most famous are generally the greatest uh, art, artworks out there. What other rules has he followed? Um, he's, his final rule is just that he's not going to be hold himself to, uh, to, 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 to those rules absolutely. So he's going to allow himself a bit, bit of leeway in terms of maybe picking a, a, an artwork which he hasn't been able to illustrate with an illustration in the book, or perhaps one that he hasn't seen himself, or perhaps one that uh, is, is like his personal favourite. Also, a sad, uh, fact of the, uh, sad, sad uh, consequence of the fact that the book has to be brief and readable for people who are new to the art world is that it's he's trying to keep it short which means that lots of great work uh, has not been able to uh, been included in the book so he admits that and he admits that actually that's heartbreaking as well so moving on to his positive aims so Gombrich's aims for the book are to introduce a new somebody who's never been for never studied uh, art or the history of art before and in what he's trying to do is show the artist's intentions so when he's talking about a work of art he's been trying to to, to illustrate the, the pro possible or probable intentions of the artist in making the world, making the work, as well as the historical context behind the work. And he thinks that's important because much of art is either an imitation or, or a contradiction to what's gone before. And he gives the example of Mozart coming to Paris for the first time and, and learning that, okay, most symphonies in Paris at that time are have really, really quick endings. So what he's going to do is shock his audience by uh, ending by with the, his last movement, uh, starting with a really slow introduction. And, and he says that this is a bit of a trivial example, but in general, it is quite true that artists do try to like revolt against their, their forebears or, or imitate them. So he's been, he, he will try to focus on, on when they do that. Um, he also admits the fact that uh, he is, there's a really heavy bias towards painting uh, as opposed to sculpture or architecture. And he says that that's because it's much, much less is lost when you illustrate a painting in a book in 2D form than if you attempt to illustrate a sculpture which is done in a round or a huge monumental building which is gigantic and three-dimensional. And But he has tried to put give our uh, architecture pride of place in each chapter by picking one uh, great uh, architectural uh, piece and placing that at the very start of each chapter uh, and so focusing on it in, in that way as well as at the end of each chapter including a brief summary of a, a life of a typical artist and talking about the kind of social context and social status of, of the art artist in this time. So that is the preface.